We've talked about transforming retail spaces. Now let's talk about transforming customers, converting those customers into advocates, and defining the customer experience network. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we have an exciting uh, panel here this, this afternoon. Uh, and why I think it's exciting is that uh, I come from a manufacturing industry, actually, so I don't belong so much to the retail. I'm trying to offer a solution to the retail industry. And in the manufacturing, we always talk of competitiveness and a competitiveness ecosystem, which basically includes actors, enablers, and drivers. What we have today on the panel is almost an equal number of actors, people who are in the retail business who have earned a brand or got some ideas there, but also uh, a brand, uh, four or five of us who are enablers who are trying to help them with technology and trying to maximize customer experience, customer advocacy. Before we go there, I think a short, uh, a short presentation about what we do at Sure Solutions, and then I will come to the next one. Yeah. John, can I have that up, please? is uh, what Sure Solutions offers you. Uh, very simply put, I think what we are doing is creating a bridge between technical problems and solutions that can be offered by technology in this case. Uh, before I get to the rest of the panel, Alan, can I ask you to come and talk to us a little bit about one of those technologies which is counting? Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Alan Thompson. The company's uh, Iris. Is. We're based in the UK, and we're a technology, technology solution provider. Uh, particularly for retail. Um, we started off uh, in thermal imaging, um, and we now have a, a really exciting new product to, to show you, just to show what is actually available to, people call them uh, offline retailers, we call them bricks and mortar shops. So it does surprise me if you're an online retailer, the amount of information you can gather about your customer Google Analytics will provide quite, quite a detailed analytics about the people that are actually visiting your website. But if you have bricks and mortar, it amazes me how many shops don't know who's coming in and going out, how successful they are at converting those customers or, or those shoppers into customers. Uh, so we have some technology that uh, I'd like to share with you uh, today. In the past, uh, we've provided very high accuracy people counting. So people counting is a little bit of a waste of time if you're only able to achieve something like 50% or if you're using beams, it's really a pointless exercise. Or maybe the security guard at the door is uh, pressing a clicker and every so often uh, a pretty girl walks past and he, he forgets to click. Um, so we are providing an accurate people count, 98% plus accuracy, but we're now able to offer more. So I'm, I have to uh, speed this presentation up, I realize. So crowd counting, customer demographic insights, dwell monitoring, density, extreme density, uh, and, and a few other things which we'll run through. We have a few little short uh, video clips. Um, so I won't dwell too much on it. Um, 
A sure count who are exhibiting uh, a couple of uh, doors down. Uh, if you're interested in the technology, come and see us either later today or tomorrow, and we can run through it in much more detail. So this is the technology working. We use a time of flight. So time of flight technology is very much like a laser uh, that you use for measuring, uh, um, uh, taking a, a distance measurement. We're sending a beam of light back and a collector then collects that and we can actually give very precise data. So we accurately count people. I'm not sure how clear the video is, but you'll see everybody is tagged and they're tagged with a height. And that's a very accurate uh, height uh, measurement. And our, um, our, our software um, has very um, sophisticated uh, analytics that, that, that looks for head and shoulders. So we're only counting people. So crowd counting. So once you start getting densely populated, video cameras struggle to, to count, and, and certainly to count accurately. But we are able to overcome that with this technology. Um, I'm going to speed up. So height tracking. So now you're able to determine a little bit about the demographics of your shoppers. Now, I'm not a huge advocate of messing with the data, but clearly you want to rule out maybe children that have no spending power uh, when you're actually counting people. And, and one of the reasons that, that um, people are counted and why smart retailers uh, count is because they want to see how successful they are at converting uh, shoppers into customers. They want to optimize their staff level, which is something we're going to be talking about in this session, customer satisfaction. So if you're uh, a retailer that needs a member of staff to interact with, with uh, the customer, you want to make sure you've optimized your, your staffing. Dwell monitoring is, is uh, very, very important. So now you're able to uh, understand how good a promotion is in a shop. Um, so how long do people spend looking up particular areas uh, of uh, uh, pop stands, uh, that sort of thing? How long will they spend? And we've tagged everybody so we know what the average uh, time that people will spend in front of uh, those, those things. So you can immediately see the impact of local uh, promotions, etc. Extreme density, I think we've talked about, so I'm going to skip that one for the sake of time. Sitting, I'm going to skip. Again, if you're really interested in this, come and see us. Um, this is quite interesting. Um, sometimes with counters, they can be distracted by um, objects such as trolleys and things like that. So in this particular uh, situation, we have uh, three people, one being a child um, and a shopping trolley. We immediately capture uh, the, the, the three people accurately. Um, Unfortunately, I can't speed these videos up, but uh, I did want to share with you the last clip, not this clip. So we, we, we've got in and out, and we are counting in and out into to a shop. Uh, so you don't have to design your shop so you have an entrance and an exit. In this situation, the, we have a, an additional child who's sitting in the trolley. And we immediately recognize that as a person, because the analytics is uh, recognizing <laughs> heads and shoulders. And that's it, I think. Thank you very much. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so that was just a glimpse of what technology can do. And so nerds like Alan and myself, this is what we do in our offices. But I think what's more important to you this evening uh, is, is uh, I go around the panel asking you a simple question. Does this really make sense? I know that you are spending a lot of money in getting these customers into your retail stores. What would be great is that if you can track all of them, dwell time, etc. But even more important is if some of us can become advocates and go out and tell other people to come to your stores online or offline. So Ranjit, why don't I go with you first? Uh, sorry, uh, yeah. Uh, maybe you can use the time to introduce yourself a little bit because I'm not doing that, and then talk to us a little bit about customer loyalty, customer advocacy, and how you experience it. Yeah, uh, my name is Ranjit. Uh, I head uh, IT at uh, Chroma, uh, the CDIT retailer. Uh, been there for the past three years. Uh, we we take uh, we take loyalty in our stores very seriously. Having said that, we do not have a formal uh, loyalty program. Uh, to 
you know, you know, uh, we ask ourselves the fundamental question, you know, why, why does a customer go and shop at a particular retailer? Uh, my personal view, two or three reasons. One is uh, the price at which you get your merchandise. Uh, second, convenience. Third is experience. Okay, there are, I don't think there is a fourth reason. There may be a fourth reason, probably, you know, you've established a rapport with, uh, with some of the salespeople or you, you have a certain level of comfort, but that's few and far between. So primarily it's convenience, price and experience. Uh, so you've really got to distinguish uh, your products, your offerings around these three parameters. Uh, a lot of, a lot of uh, uh, retailers, in the in the in, in the early 90s tried to differentiate themselves by having loyalty programs but uh, the question to ask ourselves today is do really uh, loyalty programs really work uh, they may have worked at a point in time uh, but loyalty programs are really a, uh, you know one more way of discounting your merchandise there is no real loyalty among customers so if you open your wallets you know you'll you'll see uh, loyalty cards of all major retailers who offer a compelling uh, loyalty program. In fact, uh, in, in, in the Western world, they say that if you want loyalty, get a dog. So uh, ultimately, it's all about distinguishing yourself. Uh, so how do you distinguish yourself? You really have to look at the customer's path to purchase. Uh, now there are, uh, you know, you can slice the path to purchase in many different ways, but yeah, there are really four, uh, you know, re real paths that a customer takes. One is the awareness phase, where the customer is aware about the product, aware of, uh, about the offerings. Then there is the pre-purchase, where the customer does research about the product. Uh, maybe they will go online, they will ask friends, they will visit the store, they will look at the signage. And then they, then they make the actual purchase. The purchase could be in-store, where you know uh, the points that I talked about earlier, price, convenience, all of that come into play, and then uh, in our our uh, uh, particular vertical of retail, which is CDIT, we have home delivery, uh, we have customer service, after uh, after sales support, so on and so forth, and if we have achieved all of that successfully that is when a customer will become an advocate. And even then the customer has to be prodded to become an adv advocate. You do that by asking them to write reviews on the, on the website. You ask them to uh, uh, you know, go, go on Facebook and, and like your page. You ask for NPS scores. And then you know, uh, the cycle just keeps uh, turning and, and then you get the customer to be an advocate. Sure. So primarily I think this is what uh, I think about what customer advocacy and customer experience yeah. is all about. Thank you, Ranjit. You mentioned the word NPS. So how many of us here are familiar with NPS or have been using it? Yeah, a couple of them, yeah. Maybe, Ranjit, i give you a minute just to explain that because I think that's a very useful concept. The net promoter score. Uh, yeah, and so, then we move on to, yeah. Uh, so uh, the, the process of NPS involves asking customers to rate you on a scale of 1 to 10. Uh, so uh, 1 to 8 are considered negative, 9 and 10 are considered positive scores. Then you take the sum of your, the positive scores and from that you deduct all the negative scores and that is really your NPS. Uh, yeah. So uh, proud to say that uh, Chroma today enjoys a very high uh, NPS score, uh, even better than what uh, Apple has published on his website. Excellent. Yeah, and that if, if you were looking for a score for advocacy, I think that is one of them. Yeah, uh, Richard, I want to come to you next. Uh, you really impressed me in the, in the ante room by saying, in nine months you come to 45 stores. So you're really a startup that we're all looking up to. How do you ensure customer loyalty or customer advocacy? If you're growing so fast, I'm sure you're getting a lot of repeat customers. How do you make sure that they come to you? I simply take myself as an example. So every time I want to get a customer, I put myself in that shoe and see what do I want. Yeah. So I go with the need and the want of a customer, not me because right. it's not only about me, it's about a customer. Right. Building a customer is one of the most important and the most difficult things to yeah. do. But once you do have them, you have everything. Right. So um, nine months ago, I, I launched my lingerie brand, Candy Skin, 
and I decided to be only on an online portal, which would be only mine. In 45 days, I was 100% sure I have the worst idea in my mind. And I thought, what do I do to shop? Oh, I go to all these portals. Oh, yeah. I go to all these shops. So why am I restricting my brand to not explore into all these you know, places? So the same manner, I moved Candy Skin uh, to the places where I would go to shop as a customer. Right. So I've been trying to put my footprints into all the places where I would go as a customer. So that's how yeah. the journey has been the in the last nine months. What also I realized was laundry is such an intimate product that it's very personal. And the only way you can have the word out is by someone telling you, oh, have you tried this new product? Yeah. That's when sure. the brand advocacy comes in. Yeah. So we really worked hard. Instead of doing free, instead of doing like high cost marketing, I wanted high value marketing. So I distributed like thousands of bras out and I told them, you need to try this. And that was my exact yeah. marketing cost the first three months. When the, you know, out of thousands of people, when probably like 100 people actually spoke to other 100 people, Everyone start to talk about candy skin. That's how the name got out. So brand advocacy with a customer getting involved is so important. You don't even know that. Excellent. Yeah. yeah. Get into the shoes of the customer, except that in your business it's not the shoes, but you have to get into them anyway. Yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you, Richard. Uh, Sharad, you've had a long-standing experience with a with a brand like Park Avenue. So is your experience different from what the two that we've heard? Uh, no. Uh, I mean. Uh, She's gone a step ahead in terms of uh, really making it count. Uh, but of course, uh, uh, we are at a scale uh, where we need to deploy more use of technology. So I think the moot point here is, uh, I mean, whether you call it advocacy, whether you call it satisfaction, I think uh, these are just bigger terms to use. Yeah. Uh, essentially, what we are all trying to gauge is what is customer reaction and satisfaction to your products and services. Uh, Easier said than done, I think the same customer can be extremely ecstatic at one point of time in the shop and the second day he comes, he might, uh, you know, leave the shop with a very forlorn face. So I, you know, uh, as we are scaling up our retail network, uh, you know, close to 50% of our revenues are now coming from our own retail. Uh, we thought it's extremely pertinent to uh, now start deploying technology. So we've, we've, what we have now instituted uh, is an application called Litmus in which, uh, uh, you know, uh, the moment a customer completes a purchase, he's been sent a link on his mobile and, uh, you know, there are five, six questions which are extremely objective in nature, which are not, uh, let's say, very painful for the consumer to yeah. answer. So he does the job in less than a minute. Uh, the feedback of that goes through various escalation matrix and it stops at me. <coughs> okay. So if the store manager does not close that ticket, closing the ticket means taking corrective actions and reporting. Now that could be a light issue, that light could be a size issue, everything. Right. Uh, uh, and if it, 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 if it doesn't stop within the specified period of time that we have done, it, which is approximately two or three days for the ticket to close, it escalates right to the top. Uh, advantages of these that we have found is that we've got some real-time information from the consumers. Yeah. You know, we, we, we talk about, uh, I'll give you an example of a trouser. So, I mean, uh, you know, in trousers you have trends like, you know, sometimes you keep open hems and sometimes you do not keep. You know, there are customers who have told us, hang on, in this style and this, you don't need to keep it because that's why I'm finding it. So, as, as brand marketeers and brand manufacturers, we sometimes don't realize it. Yeah. Uh, of course, there are two points of the story. So, I mean, uh, you know, uh, there are certain feedback which is uh, sometimes too voluminous to take and there is certain yeah. feedback that you should take. So uh, uh, that uh, level of analysis we still need to evolve. Uh, how much information should we be saving it to various ends? Right. But nevertheless, uh, we are on this process and, uh, and I think it's serving us great ends as we are expanding retail. Good, Charles. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, on the point of feedback, I was actually uh, very privileged to be on the Prime Minister's young CEO team. You know, you may have read he invited about 150 of us to, uh, to make us uh, what he calls champions of change. And uh, a presentation that he started his presentation with was an was a, uh, AV that he ran, which was to do with how much feedback he's taking from the ground using technology today. And it really impressed me that the government is actually doing far more than we are doing in terms of picking up feedback uh, from customers, if you may call them that. So Benazir, at Shopper's Stop, I'm, I know that you are doing a lot of this. Uh, my question to you is slightly different. How can we as technology providers help you to do your job better? 
So, uh, before we even move on to technology, the yeah. most important thing when it comes to customer advocacy, I think, is the experience part of it. But not just experience, but uh, if I look at myself as a customer, I feel experience, trust and connect becomes my most important part and technology plays a layer to connect all three right. channels to that extent. Uh, as a customer, what do I want? Uh, so when I come to the store or when I go online or through any other channel, so in the previous uh, session there was a discussion about uh, whether we are omni-channel or multi-channel. So that's something that we all should ask ourselves, though we all strive becoming an omni-channel, have we really reached there? Uh, what we are trying to do right now uh, into the across all retail categories is uh, trying to see how do we connect multiple channels trying to see uh, if we can understand customers buying pattern see how uh, how can we uh, how can we derive customers expectations yeah. through various channels like feedbacks and uh, other things and use analytics as a base uh, to uh, to really understand where my customers shopping so uh, that's an area that where we do a lot of an uh, analytics we really see whether customer uh, for example uh, is shopping shirts but is not buying a trouser right. so uh, like can we do some sort of promotions or some sort of offers to get customer connect there uh, other thing important for uh, for a brand advocacy is more uh, from a trust perspective. Do you really trust uh, me when you come to my store? Right. Or do you really trust our online channels or any channels when you come to the store? What really brings you in? So uh, is there a personal connect to it? Uh, so recently we've launched the personal shopper program which is which is really done well and we have a lot of customer stories yeah. there where uh, customers uh, after getting the personalized service have really uh, asked for the same assistant every time they come back to the store. Okay. So uh, these, these connects really drive you uh, rather than just technology but yeah you need technology as a backbone to uh, drive sure. all your initiatives. Yeah, so advocacy out of experience absolutely right. Uh, Saurabh, you've, uh, uh, from online or largely, uh, you know, offline, sorry, coming to online and you've really created a marketplace where I thought that none existed. So tell us a little bit about your experience with Food Panda. Well, I think uh, for any online platform, it becomes slightly more difficult to create that kind of uh, loyalty and, and thereby I think what we focus on is, is dominantly the three things that Ranjit mentioned initially, right? So which is, are you making it convenient because if you do not have a face to you, then the service has to do a lot more talking than right. anything else, yes. right? So thereby, the convenience plays a very important factor. The second thing, of course, is given that we are taking out a lot of uh, real estate and, and overhead costs, the expectation on the customer side is to bring in a lot more pricing yeah. uh, advantages that they want to take, uh, take home, right? So, so pricing becomes the second. And, and at the end of the day, it is the service and the experience. The only fourth parameter I would add, and that is especially true for a marketplace or an aggregator, it's basically your collection. It's your assortment. So in our case, if, if the restaurants uh, that, that people want are not there, then it kind of becomes a dampener for them to come back. So, and, and especially for a category like food, uh, where for us about 90% of, of our daily customers, daily orders are actually repeat guys. Repeat. So, so it, me it becomes even more important for us to understand them very well, to understand you know, food habits. And, and uh, you know, uh, all I can tell you is that a Gurgaon is a very different food market than yeah. a Panjayabag and right. all within the Delhi NCR region, yeah, right? right? So, so the food preferences, the food, uh, food mindset yeah. changes uh, in people every few kilometers, I would say, right? Yeah, so there's sure. shades. Yes, you can, you can say that India as a food is a, cur is a curry eating yeah, country, right. but, yeah. but then. So every, every time a repeat customer calls you do, you, do you pull up the history of his calls or uh, is it already <laughs> being done or you're thinking about that? No, no. So, of course, that is, uh, that's the bare bones, right? So that's yeah. the hygiene for us that right. if, if a customer is calling in, uh, then, then he expects us to know who he is, what the history is. Right. And thereby, a lot of our, we call them SOPs, the, the standard operating procedures, generally depend on the history of the customer with us, yeah. right? And, uh, and the funny thing for us is that there's about 2% of the orders which we generally land up in some kind of an issue or, or, or yeah. so. And the funny thing is that the repeat rate for the people who actually face a problem with the order is higher. 
is about 50% higher than the yeah, others, yeah. right? And, and, and that for us is a, a, well, you sometimes get into two mindsets, should, should we have more problematic orders or not, yeah. right? Only but if you're uh, resolving them well, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, otherwise you're so, in trouble. And, and, and that's where the, uh, the part of service comes in, yeah. because if, if you're, you're taking ownership of whatever is going wrong, I think yeah. in today's day and age, the customer rewards that much more the service much more than anything else and yeah. I don't think they'll come back for because they like the panda, yeah. right? Yeah. It, could, it could play some part but at the end of the day they have to yeah. come for the service, the, the convenience, the pricing or the assortment. Yeah. yeah, so sticking with the food and beverage industry, Karthik, uh, you are on chai point now, right? Yeah. Uh, so I know the Prime Minister evolved the other way, he went up from tea to being Prime Minister, you seem to have come to tea now, so tell us a little bit about chai point. So, uh, what are we? I mean, we are a Haganao Omni Channel brand. Um, so, we want to own the ritual of chai. So, that's the operating principle what we operate. Uh, and how do we enhance the customer experience? Yes, technology plays a very important role. Uh, I would like to give you a small example about the corporate segment. So, we have dispensers. I mean, dispensers have been uh, there for a long, long run now. So, we want to get involved with the IoT enabled technology, right? So we want to make life much easier to the admins, to the administrative block of the corporates. Uh, how do we uh, do the audit process? So we have come up with a dispenser called uh, Leaf to Cup IoT enabled, right? So technology and the retail customers walking into the store is also very important to us. So we play a very important role on the technology part to enhance the customer experience. Yeah, so IoT and machine learning. Uh, excellent example of using technology. Uh, Manoj, you've been doing something with very exciting and I think, as you put it, it's the Amazon of handicrafts, right? Or ethnic, uh, not eth yeah. handicraft, but ethnic craft. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about it and how is technology helping you to get there? Yeah, so basically, uh, you know, we are craftsilla.com, we are India's largest online ethnic, uh, I would say, uh, uh, retailer uh, plus a brand uh, play. Uh, you know, we are launching uh, a lot of our own brands. Uh, we realize that in ethnic, there's a lot of, uh, it's a pretty much unorganized sector. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, white space opportunity to create brands, uh, you know, really organize, uh, you know, all the disaggregated supply in some ways. So, so you know, when we think of customer advocacy, you know, the two ways, uh, you know, two kinds of customer we think of. One is uh, uh, who are brand advocates, right? Craftsla is a brand, or Jharoka, which is a handloom brand that we created, you know, uh, or Sutwa, which is a premium brand, you know, the brand advocacy for us revolves more on the product. You know, the product has to be really superior. The product has to be, you know, the high quality. Uh, so basically, we day in and day out think about the product. Uh, when we think about the brand part of our business, uh, when we think about the retailer part of the business, and we're going offline and online now, uh, launching our own. Uh, Online exclusive brand, uh, offline uh, exclusive brand outlets uh, uh, in multiple cities. Uh, so when we think about retail, uh, you know, the retail is about you know uh, convenience, distribution. You know, how do I get the best experience? Uh, how do I you know make the you know conversion better? Uh, those kind of stuff. So 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 when you when you enter craftsler.com. Uh, you know, uh, uh, we start tracking you. What kind of wish listing you are you doing? You know, what kind of are you? What kind of products are you adding to the cart? You know, we do a lot of our merchandising based on customer data. So, you which you may not realize, but uh, we have close to right now two lakh you know products live on Craftsla, but not all the products you interact with. Uh, you interact with primarily, uh, you know, m not more than 1,000, 2,000 products every day. And that data, uh, that curated, highly curated set of products is coming because customer is telling the other customer this is the product to choose from uh, and this is, the, this is the kind, this is a good product, this is a bad product kind of stuff. So, 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 th so when we think of a retailer, you know, there we, there we spend a lot of time merchandising, you know, making sure payments are good, logistics is good, uh, customer experience, post purchase is good. Uh, when we think about a brand advocacy, the product becomes the center yeah. for us. Yeah. yeah, good. Sonia, I want to turn to you because you talked a lot about brands and what I learned from you that you're a brand humanizer. It almost makes the rest of us feel like dehumanizers, but tell us a little bit about that interesting concept. So basically, I, I uh, work for a company called Innate Motion, and we call ourselves business humanizers. Uh, 
Uh, we are basically a branding and, and strategy uh, company. And what we feel is that before you think about a customer, you have to understand that he's a human being, he or she is a person. So when we tell our clients to talk about the target group, we say, don't look at them as customers, look at them as the people that you serve. So redefine how you look at your customers. We do a lot of work in the space of what we call purpose branding. So brands with a higher purpose. So we've, we've seen the evolution of branding, which has been talk about functional benefits, then we moved on to talking about emotional benefits. For the new generation of millennials that are coming in and the new next gen customer that's come in, we find that there are two additional P's to the marketing piece that we know which have become very relevant. One is that millennials look for purpose. So they're looking for a higher purpose than uh, you know, just the functional benefit that a product or a brand can give. The other P is what we call participation. So millennials want to contribute and participate in making the world a better place. So, so we feel that there is a huge opportunity for brands to inspire uh, customers and consumers or the people that they serve by taking on some kind of a fight that goes beyond the category level. So therefore, we talk about business humanizing. And it, it's, an, it's an interesting uh, differentiation strategy that we can adopt. We've, we've done a lot of work with a lot of FMCG brands like Unilever, for example, Dove is used to be talk about moisturizing. Dove now talks about self-esteem, and they've actually started a foundation that helps women build self-esteem through education. Another very interesting example that I wanted to share with you is this eyewear brand called Warby Parker. I don't know if you may have heard of Warby Parker. So Warby Parker uh, is a darling of the millennials in the US. So it's, it's an online, uh, eyewear company started by two uh, young professionals and they found that eyewear was really expensive and there was a monopoly in the US. It was usually brick and mortar. And, and they strongly felt that eyewear needs to be affordable all across the world. So what they did was that they started an online company, made eyewear uh, available at half the price that it was normally available. Apart from that, they also had a one-for-one -one strategy where for every uh, eyewear that somebody bought or spectacle someone bought, they would donate one to some poor bottom of the pyramid yeah. consumer. So, when, and millennials, when they, they started buying Bobby Parker, they started also connecting with this cause. So because there was a purpose and there was a cause to the brand, they just loved it. So there is a very, very high, it's almost like a cult-like following that uh, Wabi Parker has. So just taking this example for the future generation, I think uh, your malls that you have, that there's a lot of sameness in, in, in branding yeah. across malls. If a mall was to take up some kind of a fight or some kind of a cause in a country like India where there is so much to fight about, I think it would be a fantastic differentiating strategy. So that's really yeah. what I wanted to say. Yeah. Sure, that's a good thought. Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. Anil, you've spent a lot of time consulting and advising companies, uh, specifically from a millennial perspective. So what are your thoughts on this? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is important here. Um, I agree with what you, Sonia, said there. It's like um, the brand experience and uh, the, the cause is very important. So what it is, is like, <coughs> When in your company, uh, the technology that you employ has to be enabler. That should enable your company to engage your customer. Like, you know, you want to have them, uh, when they buy from you something, you tell them, hey, if you buy this, then we can help X, Y, and Z. What if you can even bring those beneficiaries into the uh, game and bring them and connect with your customers? That's where they'll start engaging. The other thing is that, you know, really, uh, there's a similarly, there's a lot of brand advocacy happening, like, you know, we're talking about making our customers our advocates. So that's where what happens is you can engage them. Um, so, like, you know, when you sell them something, you get asked for feedback. So that tells them that you care for them. And then from there on, you just keep connected 
So what happens is your brand has a direct connection with the customer. Now this is exactly what uh, these millennials really like. Is they, they, they don't want to be like, you know, you just sell them the stuff and then you forget about them. They want to be connected back so that they feel that, you know, this brand really yeah. cares for me. And so you have to have the technology, the system that can actually bring all these pieces together in your, yeah. uh, with your customer and sure. possibly take it back to the supplier. Because these days, one other thing is like fair trade. Yeah. Like, you know, we're talking about this handicraft. So what their yeah. brand uh, comes up is like, we want to promote the Indian crafts something that belongs to the country. And that's why, you know, I would go buy from them is because I want to support yeah, that last yeah. mile. That's because right. I have a confidence that if I buy from their brand, then there's a, you know, fair trade going on. They are yeah. supporting and they are not just simply, you know, sure. using those suppliers. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I know. An example that comes to mind is in the food business. I saw mm -hmm. this in, uh, in Holland, for example. Uh, you have a sticker, a barcode that gives you back to origin, I think is what it's called. And you can actually, so if you pick up mangoes in a store like Albertine and then go to, the, go to the website and with that barcode, you are actually taken back to the family that grew those mangoes. So there is a connection that you can make. So yeah, purposeful branding. Right. But let me provoke this a little bit because, so, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not a great shopper. I hate going to malls. Uh, I only go when I have to go. But I'm finding that in the last five years, if I may say so, and so that's why this is deliberately provocative, my customer experience has actually been getting worse. And it doesn't mean that the store is not good, but from getting out of my car, uh, sometimes when you are driving it yourself to park it, uh, to actually go to that shop, uh, be able to find it and most probably not find the size or the fitting that you want. Uh, maybe the collar's right, but the sleeve length is too much, etc., etc. So if you put that whole experience together, I get a feeling that we are really missing out on customer experience. And I hope I'm completely wrong. So I'm throwing it back to the panel, pick up the mic and, and, uh, and sort of uh, trash me on this if you like. Personally, I live in Delhi and I find that the customer experience that I have in a, in a market like Khan Market, because I think the store, the, all the owners have got together, formed a cooperative, so I don't know if you all remember, but uh, the parking is much better controlled there because they've got their own, they don't charge you parking fee. Somebody takes care of it. Uh, somebody takes care of all the stray dogs, so no stray dog comes after you. They're all there, very well fed, but they've found a system of doing this, keeping the place clean in spite of the mess it is in. So overall, I find that compared to a mall, which really, or a which belongs to a developer or a service provider, these guys in our cooperative are doing a far better job. And maybe it's only my thoughts, so I'd like to hear from you. Uh, in your own ways, how is it that you are helping customer experience, which I think ties into customer advocacy? So who wants to go with this first? Yeah, Alan, sure. Sorry. Uh, just, just wanted to pick up on something that Sonia said, first of all. Um, I'm actually 90 years old. Dove really works. That was a joke. <laughs> um, customer service. Um, the experience from our technology has been uh, very much uh, from our queue management side. I don't know if you're familiar with uh, Tesco's. Tesco's is one of the UK's largest supermarket uh, chains. And about uh, 14 years ago, they made a promise to their customers, which was one plus one. So they said to their customers, if you're shopping in our supermarket and we have empty checkouts, there'll never be more than one person in front of you in the queue. Now they failed to deliver on that. And they failed to deliver on that because they were incenting the management to deliver that promise. And the management told the cashiers, you press one on the cash till all the time so that I get my bonus. So they came to us for a technology solution, which we, we provided, um, which is a queue management system which will deliver that one plus one. Moving on, um, uh, Kroger, which is the um, largest grocer in the world, a US chain, bigger than Walmart for groceries, uh, I think about 3,000 supermarkets now. They now, not only do they adopt that system, um, but they actually tell their customers by uh, way of uh, LCD screens uh, behind the, the, the cashiers, they tell their customers just what experience they will get. You know, they, they will tell them that there are X number of checkouts open now. In 15 minutes, our system can, can tell them how many checkouts they need to have open and in half an hour. And the whole idea behind this is that they have a, a happy cashier uh, dealing with the customers. So the, the, the last experience, and this is 
for all retailers, I guess, the last experience a shopper has of that shop is with the cashier. So if they're looking at a big long queue thinking this day is just dragging on, they're not going to be very happy. Whereas if they know that the system is working on their behalf, they'll smile at the customer, greet the customer. So that's kind of uh, from our technology perspective how we've actually been able to deliver uh, a good customer experience. Yeah. Queue management, good cash yeah. yeah, Richard, you want to add to that? Yeah. Okay, hi. So I think that it's not only customer that needs to be an advocate to your brand. Firstly, to improve customer experience, your employee needs to be an advocate. So there's a missing gap there because people work for needs in India. So it really matters and depends how do you treat your organization. So everything comes down to how have you yeah. been with your organization. For example, at Candy Skin, I only and only promote female employees. Right. I make sure everyone's, you know, uh, not everyone can be from a, you know, a very comfortable house, but I make sure they're comfortable with me. I make sure my, they're comfortable in my organization. And I make it a point that they get to learn as much as they can and whatever's missing in their lives. They automatically turn into brand advocates for me. And employee advocates are, is one of the most important things. And I think that is like missing out in India. Yeah, sure. In a very big manner. Right. Yeah, so uh, training, I guess, is a big part of what you're talking about. How do you, how do you make sure that, uh, you know, for example, a lot of brands are even difficult to pronounce for a lot of the staff that is selling them. Exactly. You, know? you just so, have to so be how do you nice get, yeah. and educate and treat them well. Right. There's nobody, there's too much of a gap. There in, is, yeah. In the Indian. That's right. Um, in a country like I India, agree. we are such liberal people, and still there's so much of a gap. If I get to learn something today, I would really, really be happy to teach something to my employee, yeah, yeah. and in return, she's going to be really loyal to me. So cool. my employee loyalty is even more important yeah. than my customer loyalty, because I'm agree. sure that my employee will get me a customer for sure. Yeah. So uh, I yeah, think so employee to improve customer yeah. experience. Employee advocacy even before customer advocacy yeah. is expected. Definitely. Sure. Yeah. Anil, do you yeah. want to add? Yeah, I would like to take a shot at that. Yeah. Um, particularly uh, in our experience, like our company, uh, our customers, uh, we've been serving the market in U.S. And there's this comp uh, you know, process uh, and the programs they call employee programs where uh, all these multi-brand store employees, uh, they, uh, they are offered training on the different, by different brands on their products. And uh, as the employees take their trainings on the products, they get, you know, they accumulate points. And those points help them buy the, those brand products at really heavy discounts. Yeah. And this encourages those employees to learn uh, about the product so that when the customer comes to the store, they are really, you know, answering the right qu questions in the right form because they experience, a lot of times they are wearing their shoes, right? Or the shirt. So when they're talking about the product, they tell them, hey, you know, I, I like it, I use it. Yeah. Because they got it for much less and these brands are really premium. Yeah. So, you know, this is our customers are doing and uh, this is very popular in outdoor space in US. Yeah. And similarly, there is professional programs. So a lot of, you know, small, yeah. uh, very uh, pro professionals that are like, you know, your local, uh, you know, high school, uh, you know, queen of the year or a you know, yeah. handsome man of the year or something like that to uh, sports and all those things. Yeah. They, they engage them sure. and make them brand ambassadors. Yeah. So, you know, there sure. are all those programs that make right. it happen. Uh, another good example that comes to mind is we, we uh, in our engagement with Fab India, uh, you know, as, as suppliers to them, we also sold them video walls. And I was very pleased to see, in fact, my wife brought it to my notice that she was shopping there and they had a behind the cashier where uh, Alan, your queue management system was not there, so the queue was pretty long. Uh, but she spent some time, and she wasn't upset about it because on the video they were showing a video of great details about how the dyeing of that particular, I forget what it was, but some kind of silk, how difficult it is to do, how many people work on that whole thing, how many livelihoods are actually being supported uh, by the yarn that you're buying. And so they really managed to, with that one video, I think at least converted my wife into somebody who began to appreciate all the efforts that went behind it. So it's not just employees, sometimes uh, things like this could help you. Because there is a lot that goes in. I mean, in my own business, um, uh, which is capacitors, which is a component, we make about 4 million pieces a day. So we waste about 1%, which is a global benchmark. But that means still a few hundred thousand pieces have to be destroyed every day. 
you know, because we don't want them to go out in the market. And one of the simple things we do is a 9 a.m. prayer, and once in 15 days we invite these 300 people who are there in the prayer in the morning uh, to come to the scrapyard where these a few hundred thousand pieces are being scrapped. And just the visual of scrapping good capacitors, uh, I think has had the most important impact on them, on waste reduction, on lean management, uh, etc. So I think it's, yeah, just getting the people into the supply chain, into what goes making, into making those fantastic products. I don't know, Manoj, if you have a similar experience with Craftsville, because I'm sure your artisans are doing a lot of hard work in this area. Yeah, they do. Uh, basically, uh, you know, we interact with a lot of these artisans in the village. I travel a lot. Uh, so it's very heartening, uh, uh, you know, to see that, you know, we are making a lot of impact on the ground. Uh, you know, one of the brands which we have, uh, Jaroka, which is a handloom brand. Uh, and I don't know how many of you know about handloom, but uh, handloom is uh, considered the second largest activity in rural India right now. Uh, pretty much in a bad state, uh, but uh, really beautiful products they create. Uh, really a great heritage of India that is getting lost somewhere. Uh, but it's uh, but it's interesting, you know, how uh, you know because of disintermediation of uh, multiple uh, middlemen, uh, these uh, handloom artisans That's are now right, getting yeah. lot of lot of economic output from what they are producing. So. So a lot of handloom clusters, uh, yeah. you know, we are able to revive because of sure. that, uh, which is an yeah. uh, interesting phenomenon. Uh, and, uh, you know, we should, we should never say that, uh, you know, we should be proud of such handloom that's clusters right. that we have. I think yeah. that's something that... Uh, I guess some kind of fair trade is... is yeah, it's very fair trade, there, yeah. you know, just... Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, so something, sure. you know, we feel very excited about when we go to office, yeah. that you know, some impact is happening somewhere. If okay. I could just add to Yes, that, sure, uh, Sonia. Yeah, and so, I'll come I mean, you. since you were talking about uh, Fab India, it's very interesting that I actually met the CEO of Vinay Singh of Fab India a um, couple of days ago in Delhi. And uh, he was telling me that they had just done some focus groups uh, with, uh, you know, millennials. And uh, so there's very strong uh, equity that Fab India as a brand has. But they only knew, I mean, they said, yes, these are ethnic brands. So it's an ethnic brand. So we love it because it's an ethnic brand. But they did not know the full weaver story. Yeah. So once Fab India told them that, you know, this is what happens, there are weavers involved and um, not just that, they are also shareholders, there's no middle right. one. They were, you know, they said, wow, we didn't even know this. Yeah. And to that extent, you know, they get more engaged with the brand. So the brand na yeah. narrative needs to change in sure. future so that you're able to connect with the millennials who really treasure, you know, Indian yeah, heritage. Yeah. So there is a lot of opportunity for yeah. existing brands to relook at your story and see how can you, yeah. you can reconnect with millennials as well. True. The purpose behind the organization. The purpose behind yeah, or for those of you, Simon Sinek's Power of Why. I don't know if you've seen that TED talk, yeah. but it's really worth looking at it. The yeah, Power sure. of Why. That's power of Why. Yeah. That power. That's right. Yeah, sure. And in our own, yeah. own case, sorry, just one more. Uh, sure, sure. Uh, is the, the Jagore campaign, Tata Tea campaign, which is the power of 49. Yes. Yeah. That's been a huge Excellent. success yeah. as well. That is a really good campaign. Uh, Sharad, you wanted to... <laughs> Interestingly, everybody has branched on... Uh, to consumer experiences and how the etymology of products has been. I was just fixated over the last five minutes about your question that shopping experience, and that was a provocative statement, as you said, has kind of declined in the last decade or so. Uh, I think there's a different perspective to it. My answer would be no. I think it has improved. Uh, I think the exposure uh, uh, of the consumer towards international brands, towards shopping experiences, towards online convenience has kind of raised the expectations, which is not a bad thing that should happen to the yeah. industry. Uh, the fact is that the industry is yet to catch up. Uh, you know, I mean, one of the things that we consistently grapple as decision making is returns. Now, uh, uh, there are there are cases of consumer abuse, but uh, really, uh, the percentage of consumer abuse uh, over a total turnover is minuscule. Uh, yet, we as corporates shudder to take those decisions because uh, you know the overall community of our yeah. business partners hasn't. Uh, risen up to that level. So that's, I think that's an evolution yeah. in place, but I think, uh, at least in my personal yeah. view, it's, 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 it's improved. Uh, I mean, coming yeah. from apparel, I can tell you 20 years back when we, we were shopping uh, at a mom and pop store, uh, it would write in Hindi, yeah. fa fashion ki yug mein guarantee ki yeah. Yeah. Nobody talks that, that's you know, true. language right now. Uh, 
Yeah, yeah. So I, I think it's improved and, and you know, yeah. uh, my miles to go. I, I would give you that, yeah. yeah. I think, yeah, from a restaurant language, I would say that the, the layout has changed beautifully, the decor is better, the menu has improved tremendously, but maybe on the service, I'm just being too harsh in my expectations, I guess. Uh, with that, I think, uh, should I throw open the floor or you want to add something? Yeah, I just and, wanted and to add, add one little thing yeah. there that, you know, when you came in and said, uh, if I walk into the mall store and I look for a shirt but I don't find the right size, and this is where this whole omni-channel scenario kicks yeah. in, yeah, yeah. that uh, the store should be empowered to help you out there and say, well, you know, hey, th you like this style and everything, but exact size is not there, but I can get it to your home uh, in short span of time. Yeah. Yeah. And probably you will actually buy at that point. So this is where this whole idea of omni-channel is very important yeah. and that's why all your brick and mortar stores you know don't have to carry all the inventory they can be very lean uh, yeah. at that point uh, but then you know if they had the right tools uh, so that they can get their customer the product they, they will, want yeah. still uh, not lose the opportunity yes yeah. sure. that's good. true good on that happy note yeah we have time to take a few questions yes sir Please introduce yourself and yeah, if, if uh, there is a particular person that you want to address it to, then let us know. I can that. leave it open to the okay. panel. Sure. Uh, myself, Mayank, I am from Titan. Titan. Yeah. Yeah. So my question is, someone just mentioned that uh, employee engagement and, you know, the advocacy by the employee is equally important or to some extent more important than the consumer advocacy. Uh, there is this franchisee concept, right? We have company stores, we have franchisee stores. Yeah. Though we have a super control on company stores, uh, keeping a same level of standardization in terms of control over the companies, over the franchise stores is a challenge. So how do you ensure that the employees of franchise stores, because say in Titan, almost 70% of our business is driven by franchise stores. Yeah. How do you bring that piece into picture? Sure. Richa, you want to take that or, yeah, or Anil, okay, you go yeah. first and then Richa second. Yeah, again, you know, this comes back to the employee program. And uh, in U.S., actually, uh, if you look back, there was a company called 3.5. There is a company called 3.5. And uh, they specialize in this employee training programs. And especially all these multi-brand stores like Macy's or JCPenney and Dick's and all these uh, big stores, uh, they uh, use them uh, as a service. And the employees of these stores go through the training programs. And actually, brand owners make them take that, those courses. And they had to uh, take them back again at certain frequency, uh, frequency. And in turn, those employees get some kind of loyalty, you know, discount coupons from these big brands. Yeah. And that's how you engage your franchisee. Uh, this is one of the models that has really worked very well. And uh, we as our company, as a provider, also have participated in that channel. That's why I can say with confidence okay. that this really works. Yeah, sure. Richa, you want to add to that? So basically, you don't really have any control as such, but you can make a guideline book, a, bri a brand guideline book, and you can follow that. And what you can really do to control something like this, to have the training to be done in a perfect manner is have regional heads who make sure that they are going through the training to the T. That's yeah. all you can do about it. Okay. And there has to be a lot of, not everything can be money driven, right? There has to be a lot of emotion driven, um, you know, like there needs to be a purpose, like she said. Yeah. So the moment you have a purpose, the moment you tell the employee, listen, this is what's, what it's going to be, these are the guidelines, this is what you have to achieve, this is what we're going to help you with, and you give them a little certain incentive as well, it really helps your brand. And yeah. it kind of gives you an employee advocacy right there. Yeah. Well, just uh, in addition to that, so I had a personal experience with a Maruti dealership that was trying to rent out one of our buildings in Noida. And uh, so the gentleman who came to negotiate the rate was actually the, the brand sort of uh, the brand manager for Nexa, which is what they were doing. And so I asked him a question, how do you make sure that you, know, you still have 50% plus market share in spite of so many years? And he had a very simple but a very interesting answer. So he says, you know, as the brand manager, I am personally responsible that this franchisee, that's his dealer, makes money out of this store. And he says, because of that, I cannot pay you more than this as the rent for your building. Because this is the number of cars he will sell. This is my mathematics on it. And I'm personally responsible. My KRA is driven by this guy's profit and loss statement. 
So I think there is also a little bit of ownership of the franchisee that at least I saw in that one case, and I wasn't surprised that they've done so well. You know, so I hope that answers. If I can yes, take a short sure, sure, at yeah. I mean, this is typically a question for an HR manager, but being a technology guy, let me give a technological perspective. Uh, over the past few, few years, there have been a lot of improvements in technology, especially in the areas of artificial intelligence. Okay, uh, today we are seeing trends where a lot of customer interaction is happening through bots. So one, one of the things that Titan could try doing is move some of the more uh, uh, inane customer interactions. When I say inane, what is a store location? Uh, can I get this particular product in, in this store? What till what time is the store open? You know, some generic questions and these generic questions will, in our experience, form about 60% of the questions that uh, a customer will ask. And you could really have really high skilled, better paid, better quality employees to actually serve the customer to sort of, you know, to take a page out of shopper stop books. Uh, a personal shopper, somebody who helps you, somebody who understands you, somebody who talks you, understand what kind of a person you are, what kind of taste you have, and suggest products that will, you know, fulfill them. You could, you could move, you know, those areas to better paid, better quality employees and move the more inane kind of uh, work to technology. Yeah, sure. Good. Time for one more question, one last question. Yes, ma'am. Hi, uh, my name is Anushka. I work with Westside. Uh, the question is to either Sharad or Manoj or anybody from the panel. Uh, how are you leveraging uh, social media platforms like Facebook and Instagram towards customer experience? Mm -hmm. That's our assignment <laughs> for Westside. <laughs> Who wants to answer that? Sharad, you want to? Yeah, okay, sure. To Sharad, yeah. So if I follow your question, you are saying, how are we leveraging social media platform for customer advocacy? Yeah, uh, specifically Facebook and Instagram. Yeah, so uh, these are specific handles that we, so I'll tell you the approach that we are following uh, at the group level. Uh, we've institutionalized a cell which is specifically catering to these social handles. Uh, we being a large corporate, uh, there are cross-functional uh, uh, databases that we have gathered. And uh, we've been finding extra traction that we are gathering out of them. So uh, I think a simple answer to your question is that, uh, yeah, uh, th I mean, we are at, uh, honestly speaking, we are at the initial stages uh, of uh, really exploiting these handles. Uh, we, we, have, we have less than a minuscule turnover coming out of it, but our plans to grow this uh, via these handles is, is extremely manifold. Uh, cannot disclose numbers right now, but yeah, those are important tools for us now. And you'll hear more about it in the next session. Okay. Yeah. I can tell you how, um, how can social media really help you with customer advocacy, because that's what I do majorly. So basically, uh, to increase customer advocacy through your social media platforms, you need to share a lot of customer stories with your own social media. So nowadays, if, for example, you buy an apple, and I mean to say, say you buy an X thing, and that X person, X social media platform, promotes that you bought an X thing, you automatically get very happy and you keep on posting about them. So social media interactions with customers in terms of brands sharing customer stories is a very hit thing, actually. Um, I don't know how many of you all follow IKEA, but IKEA did a campaign called Joy of Storage Happiness. It was something like that. It was a hashtag that they did to increase customer advocacy. And um, basically, the whole deal was whoever had a storage from an IKEA was asked to post it on a Facebook or an Instagram. And whoever had the prettiest post would get, you know, something for free from IKEA. Mm -hmm. So certain interactions like these really help um, customer advocacy to increase. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. We'll just squeeze in that last question, then we'll. 
Hi. So, Shubham this side. I am representing Red Chair Consulting. So, as far as brand penetration goes in our country, that we all understand and agree that is very, very low right now, right? It's been not more than 10, 15, 20 years we have started on the journey and it's going to take time. We reach Starbucks, we reach Harley Davidson where brand advocacy evangelist will come into play. That we call it. Right. But as of basics also, when we, when we are going to open a store or an e-commerce store for sake, where does the, where does the brand uh, customer advocacy or the brand customer experience comes into play? Because the first priority is our top line, the second is our bottom line and 10 number, 10 number of things before this customer experience comes into play. So actually are we, are we focused enough to, to make this our building block of our brand? Do we, do we accord it the highest priority is your yeah, question, right? And that is what the question is. I'm so sorry if I am meaning any sense, any sense over here. Yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, I'll give you the answer from a very online side of the world perspective, okay? And, and uh, when I was initially speaking as well, I think for, for an online aggregator per se, your experience is the only currency you have. Right. So, uh, and the simplest way that we have found to to put it at, put it in the P and L, if if that's what you're looking for, is to see the customer lifecycle value. Okay. And uh, what what happens is, especially for a high repeat category, and and again, there's no one size fits all. There's no one brush uh, that can paint every every single segment, every single industry. But but especially in any high high repeat category. Your experience defines how many times the customer is going to come back. You're going to pay once for the acquisition, and then for us, like I said, 90% of the daily orders come from customers uh, who repeat, and 50% of those are those who have placed at least 10 to 15 orders with us. All right. So, so in that case, your experience bit starts showing up directly both into your top line as well as bottom line because you repeat is the only thing that derives entire business value and the, the metric for that for us is the CLV. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thanks, yeah. thanks. thanks. Thank you. With that, I think we come to a close of the session. Bang on time. So I don't know about the value of what we added to you, but in terms of time, we score 10 on 10. Even if I have to say it myself. <laughs> you did? Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Please give the panel a big round of applause. Sir.